Hello and welcome to this episode of The Defenders in which we will look at the two front threat that India faces which has become now more prominent over the last one year as the China-Pakistan nexus on India's borders cannot be ignored anymore. And this has led to our armed forces preparing and readjusting their resources and their capabilities to meet the challenge posed by China and Pakistan. This two-front threat has become the primary driver for India's armed forces. As they reorient themselves to the reality of the challenges faced from China and Pakistan on our land borders, as well as the maritime threats and the air threats, all in a combined scenario, which we will discuss over the next 30 minutes in this episode of The Defender. Welcome to this episode of The Defenders, in which we are looking at something which is rather topical and which needs much deeper understanding and at least some understanding at the level of the general public. And therefore, my decision to have this episode with two informed officers who can give us greater insight into how India is preparing for and how India would respond to the two-front threat. And we have with us Air Vice Marshal Srivastav, who has worn many hats, both in the Air Force and later in the post-service life in the corporate sector, where he has initiated a number of equipment-related initiatives which are important for these services. Uh, one area which we must give him credit for is for having instituted information warfare from the 1990s and created a sense of understanding and debate within the military circles, if not the rest of the country. And of course, we have somebody who I have known for long, General Bhatia, former DGMO, former director of Senjos, and most recently, author of another collection of essays on national security. So I'll start with you, General Bhatia, sir. This is an area, two-front threat, uh, which we cannot take lightly. What the Chinese activities in LAC have done, and I think you'll probably agree with me, has got us to relook at and reprioritize our balance of forces. As a former DGMO, you would have always looked at the map and said, how do we respond to multiple threats? And there is now a serious case for having at least one, if not two strike corps looking at China to take advantage of any ingress the Chinese might make by enacting the revolving door policy by which we might make some gains also and say, Let's go back to the accepted lines. So that's one. The second aspect is, how do we deal with the persistent niggling of Pakistan on the LOC particularly and the various parts of the Northern Command, border, LOC, AGPL and beyond. So broad overview before we come on to specifics. Uh, thank you, Maruf. I think it's a, uh, you covered a very uh, broad uh, spectrum. It's a complete... You know, it's a full spectrum of conflict that we are talking about right now. Uh, the two-front uh, uh, threat has always been there. Uh, the only thing that has manifested uh, closer to uh, activation uh, since April of last year, mm. Uh, mm. after the Chinese aggressive mm. behavior along the line mm. of actual control. Uh, but the fact remains that the armed forces always prepare for the worst case scenario. And uh, it's not it's not catered for earlier. So we have, uh, you know, this has given us a push for a strategic rebalancing. We have to do strategic rebalancing. Uh, our budgets are limited, uh, our resources are limited, and uh, we cannot be expecting the moon. There is national, uh, you know, competing at the national level. So the strategic rebalancing has been uh, given a big push uh, by the Chinese aggressive behavior uh, along the LAC. We were very, you know, uh, our focus was towards the Western neighbors, uh, who, as you rightly said, have uh, they're a mischievous neighbor. Let, let me also say that mischievous neighbor who have been continuing with a proxy war for the last, you know, four decades or so. Uh, bleeding India with thousand cuts. So we found answers to that. So on the one hand, when we took look at a two-front war, 
uh, I look at a collaborative approach by Pakistan and China, not a collusive approach. A collusivity is inbuilt in that. But uh, the worst case is a collaborative approach. In that, uh, if we uh, have a war with China, we should be prepared for a war. Because if we're not prepared, we'll have a war. If we are prepared, we'll not have a war. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, uh, if you want to deter China from waging a war, then you have to be prepared for a war. Because with China, it's a war prevention strategy we're talking about, not a war waging strategy. So, uh, when uh, I don't think China will wage a war if we are prepared. Uh, but if China wages a war, Pakistan definitely will wage a war against us. Mm. Mm. Uh, whereas the uh, converse may not be true. If Pakistan and India go to war, China will protect its own interests, project its own interests, and may not, you know, it may do some posturing or some, you know, just uh, something. But I don't think it's not happened earlier, neither in 71, nor in 99, nor earlier. So, uh, but as far as the capabilities are concerned, we'll have to balance out a threat-based capability and a capability-based capability. So that balance has to be there, and we, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of our, uh, you know, strategic thinkers say we are a very large army. Well, let me also say that the large army uh, is required because territorial integrity is non-negotiable. We have the uh, longest uh, unsettled borders, three, four, eight kilometers with China, and another, like you rightly said, AGPL of one, two, six kilometers and seven, seventy-one kilometers of uh, LC. And uh, along that, it is holders keepers concept, especially along the line of control. So if you do not have observation fire control over the line of control, or you do not regularly patrol your line of actual control, then you're li liable to lose out on your territories. So that is where I think the strategic rebalancing is a must. And like you rightly said, you know, two strike cores. I remember as the DGMO in 2013, 17th of July, I remember the date, the CCS sanctioned the, uh, what we loosely call the mountain strike core. I know. Actually, it's not a mountain strike core, it's an accretion force. It is much more than a mountain strike core. It is about 90,274 men to be precise. Uh, it is at a cost of 64,716 crores. I got the figures uh, still in my head. And uh, it was to come over eight years. So 2013 was sanctioned. The government's... Uh, so it should have been in place now. It should have been in place now. And, uh, you know, uh, it, was not, it was not anticipated. But then again, we have... Uh, 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 we have, resource, we have res limitations. Res so you, limitations. You've made some very important points. Sir. M. Ashish Sivasar, now... As I look at the big picture, you know, one of the things I always do is whenever I do discussions on television, in front of me, I have the map. And I'm trying to understand that on one side, the Air Force is rightfully concerned about the depleting strength of our air squadrons. On the other side, the Air Force has now in its inventory certain aircrafts which are clearly force multipliers. So you go back to the 42 squadron argument, then you go back to also having NATs, as far as I'm concerned. Sorry, I'm sort of taking a, a position on that. But if you continue to have the kind of aircrafts like Rafale is, which 4.5 generation, and you might have more of certain variants coming in, so you're not, is the 42 squadron benchmark a limitation in our ability to go to war or as we have shown to the Chinese that we can respond come what may. And the Chinese myth of the J-20 Chengdu being a fifth generation aircraft has been exposed by certain Sukhoi aircrafts which have cited it and picked up photographs of that. So you can't pick up photographs of a fifth generation aircraft as far as I know. Your view, sir. So Maru, firstly, thanks a lot being on your show and uh, a very happy Indian Air Force anniversary to all the viewers. We are recording it on 8th October. Uh, numbers do worry the planners. There's no doubt about it. But when we talk about numbers, the Indian Air Force today does not hinge only on numbers. Absolutely. As you rightly brought out, the quality matters. We keep talking about in public domain about 30 squadrons and 42 squadrons. That's a journey. And I guess we'll be able to cover it up by 2032. Uh, Some people say by 40, but yes. That's a journey. What I really feel is the quality matters and the kind of weapons we got in our armor. If you talk of Meteor, you talk of Scalp, you talk of the inability or infeasibility of our... You take our ALGs into account. We yes. got 11 of them. Yes. yes. So we can operate from areas which are very close to where we can inflict. I'm talking about northern border. We can yeah. inflict really uh, very hard. And when we take our, the mountainous range into incorporate that and see how many high altitude sorties Chinese can launch at us True. and at what level. 
that is the smaller picture of the northern front but they ought to also preserve their sovereignty in terms of south china sea in terms of indian ocean region in terms of so many other things which happen because there's a xinjiang factor there's a inner mongolia factor all these will combine together so it's not that anyone is free from doing anything they wish to do numbers will not then it is th when you couple these capabilities today what we are talking about we talked about informatized warfare that was the domain in which talking about now we are talking about intelligentized warfare my worry is little bit more over there when i merge all these uh, you know power scenarios into one satellite anti satellite weapons direct energy weapons which will all be fired from the platform airborne platform then we talk about cyber attacks we talk about our airborne early warning or airborne warning and control systems which are coming into play and then ultimate being which which will be talked about a lot in future to come is unmanned systems or inorganic soldiers i'm coming to that <laughs> okay so these things will become a kind of precursor so if you really ask me i am not worried neither the air force is worried as you see in the and nor uh, am i uh, or and what is the most heartening feature which the viewers must understand we are going on the indigenous path taking that path mm. i think in the next segment of this program we may be talking about it mm. is the most important part atmanirbharta that mm. pleases me even when i was in air force putting on the blue mm. i always think nobody has won the war by borrowing weapons from somebody yes. you ought to have your own weapons your own barrels yes. your own uh, things to fight on yes and that's how we are going to do so there is a process there is a strategy and there is a method on top of it there's one more factor morale of the country any country which does not have a purpose to fight the war will never win you have taken in afghanistan the case is right there a very powerful nation lost a case because people do not know general people why are you fighting this war and and another element to it which i often talk about but people are a bit hesitant because it's politically incorrect to say that if you're not willing to die yes. you will not win a war so what we say the blood cost of the war we as indians in air force army navy or our citizenry in general are willing to pay the cost yes. because very, we are not offending point. anybody very, very, we are trying to uh, just restore the integrity of our own territory very good point uh, sir so, uh, i go back to general bhartia sir uh, you know the the cds general bipin rawat has been on record to say that we are confident that he is confident that indian troops will be able to thwart any such threat and have already laid out plans to that effect and then as a follow up the army chief general naravne has gone on record to say that most of our aggression will be concentrated on primary fronts but we will adopt more deterrent posturing on the secondary front please elaborate no uh, china is a challenge there is no doubt no denying that fact uh, but we are uh, as a we reasonably well prepared uh, to face uh, the chinese threat when it manifests and the chinese threat is basically uh, presently if we seen it in the last one and a half years plus now uh, it is aggressive behavior along the line of actual control and uh, we have matched them in equal numbers we have a, a mirror deployment as we call it equitable proportional deployment and uh, it is based on the philosophy of no blinking no brink match uh, which is which is a very good operation philosophy uh, uh, and we are talking about high altitude areas where we have the expertise so i think what the chief of the defense staff and the chief of the army staff are saying is that while we hold them right now we also have to look at the threats in the near to mid term or i would say in the immediate to near term and the threats are not only in eastern ladakh they are all along the line of actual control and i i do feel that uh, it is not only the army it has to be the three services and much more together uh, with the chinese i think we, we what we need is a 3d strategy while we defend along the line of actual control we dominate the high seas and we deter china's aggressiveness by you know binding to balance with the uh, other nations with which, which we have convergence congress of interest and at the same time building capabilities building infrastructure we been lacking in infrastructure in a very big way um, you know you are aware of that and yes. our 
we have to give it a push. This mm -hmm. push was given 2005 onwards, but uh, for the last uh, 16 years, uh, we not really achieved the results which we wanted to achieve. The push has been in the last uh, couple of years or little more than that. So infrastructure has to be uh, given and we'll have to build capabilities in other domains because China is not, will, the, the Chinese state is not confined to the LSE alone. The, today it is all about cyber warfare, information warfare, political warfare. If you look at the unrestricted warfare philosophy of China which it follows, then we'll have capability in other domains also, yes. and which are, which are being done. It's not that not being done, it is being done. And let me assure you, Maru, uh, through your show to the viewers, that we are capable of handling uh, the present situation. But oh. we have to continuously upgrade our capabilities. Okay. Very well brought out, sir. Uh, in fact, uh, Air Marshal, I want to understand a small point from you and a big point. The small point is that Jan Bhatia's entire narration has been focused on the territorial threats we face on the mountainous areas largely, where the Air Force can be very effective, but it also has a limitation like it had in Kargil, that if there is a larger national diktat that you will not cross the LOC, then at that speed of sound, how do you identify the LOC with which peaks which correlate with the map that the pilot is wearing on his thigh? How do you correlate that? And the second thing is, and that's a bigger problem, is China's whole desire to unleash unrestricted warfare, uh, which is not just cyber attacks on a city like Mumbai, could be on a city like Delhi tomorrow, but it is also economic attacks. It is also attacks in the Indian industrial platforms. After all, that is something which is leading us on to better preparedness. How do we uh, just explain to the viewers in simpler terms that how do we remain alert to that? What are the symptoms that would get your antennas up the moment you see them happening? So as you rightly said, when you think about any kind of conflict, you have the Indian map in front of you. That must flash in front of you and that gives you a terrain map and the map. So as far as our war waging capacity is concerned, if I take space, cyber, uh, air and other domains into considerations like UAV, considered because we are talking about futuristic warfare. Mm -hmm. I feel, firstly, as of now, if we take the snapshot, yes, uh, it may cause worry, which we need to handle. And as of now, we are progressing. If I take the direction and the speed, I would not be so bad. That is first to say, just to put the viewers at rest. Mm. But coming to the larger picture, mm. as you rightly said, mm. the larger picture is that if we take the global scenario, mm. is there a possibility, mm. is there a possibility of three nuclear armed nations which form, I mean two of us among China and us, we form mm. more mm. than one third of the humanity. Yes. Be at war for a very, very long time mm -hmm. and everybody tolerating that you remain at war? No, there will be international forces which will be exerted upon and they will have to come to some true, some kind of, you know, understanding. What remains to be seen that if a Kargil-like situation arises, what made me really win the Kargil war through the air effort, if I talk about the air effort apart from the valor yes. of the soldiers yes. over there, was that I could do precision bombing and I could have the targeting, what we call targeting acquisition system very much in place. So these two are the technologies on which the Air Force has to ride. Does it have it? No. So coming to that, the, uh, the imagery in the cockpit is one of the concepts which started 20 years back. We are working on it. But yes, we can, to a large degree, we can understand where our targets are through our ISR systems and through other systems like airborne early warning systems as for the aircraft. For ISR, we can really locate where these, uh, you know, aggregations or the orbits are. And of course, uh, as far as their airfield positions are known, they are known to us. So we know how to strike to disable their air supremacy or air superiority. I don't foresee that they would be able to cross the mountains, come to us and establish air superiority or area where we are doing the real fight. Very true. Okay. Very true. In fact, uh, if that approach was adopted by the government in 1962, Too, rightly said. The, the situation would have been different. Absolutely. I've been doing a lot of work on China, so mm. I'm quite familiar Absolutely. with the you historical legacy, which mm. we should not allow it to be repeated. Yeah. Can I go to General? Yeah, please. General, sir, I want to understand from you, you know, 
there are two situations that we are in one is the possibility of near term threat which would come out of an explosive situation anywhere on the boundaries borders or the areas which are militarized loc lac what have you and there is a situation of a long term prevention of conflict scenarios where there is room for much more aggressive diplomacy which needs to work very closely in sync with the military elements to understand that you cannot in the words of paraphrase krishna menon talk china out of the conflict you have to talk from a position of strength so what would you recommend could be a joint diplomatic military thrust towards any of our two neighbors who have intentions which we are now clearly aware of are not very happy ones for us how do we go about it no uh, uh, that is the key question actually how do we go about it how do we you know in the in the in the end we want long term peace stability and development so that, that is the national name i suppose to transform india to a modern prosperous and a secure nation uh so i i i feel that you know it's not that it is not in sync the military and the diplomacy is not no, i'm not sync. saying it's not in sync but i'm saying how more, do we make more, it more needs to be done yeah okay uh, there has to be a more synergetic approach uh, among the and the ccs comprises of four ministries we all know that but that is where i think after that uh, there there is a gap uh, i'll give you a small example and let's be honest about uh, about it to ourselves the most sensitive border which is with china the lc is manned by two different forces indian army and the itbp and the itbp and the itbp is under command of the ministry of home affairs yes. right they have their own chain of command and they are often and i commander core on the lc i would know and there are times when there are conflicting orders being passed either by the ministries or intermediate headquarters so uh, and it is not that's not been done along the lc the bsf which is also a central armed police force under the ministry of home affairs works under operational control of the army so does the assam rifles so there are there is presidents and i do feel that you know s- small things can be ironed out these there, there are very sensitive issues actually uh, so these can be ironed out i am not saying that itp is not doing a good job doing a good job but the coordination the cooperation which is required is at the individual levels so when we talk about synergistic approach i think we need a synergistic approach in all elements of national power diplomacy military economic and informational and if we have that and i i'm not saying we don't have it but we need need to do it better the challenges today are totally different the challenges are from the low intensity conflict right up to the nuclear and uh, it is facing us uh, the the two two uh, front threat is uh, can manifest if we are not ready that's what i've been saying all along a lot of people say no no jalsa war is not possible hope it is not never happens war is never uh, an option war is always a last resort uh, but things can go very wrong so okay. that that is where i feel that we need i i got your point sir i i about synergy and uh, there is that whole debate about watertight compartments that government of india's agencies of quick words sir before we wrap up in terms of matching to china's aggressive intent just list out four or five technologies that we should look at acquiring in op immediate uh, manner so i would list artificial intelligence as the prime most driver of all our we have Next. to convert our this thing into ai that is the first thing but Second, artificial intelligence has its limitation too much dependence on it eats into decision making uh, when it comes to let's say uh, uh, we marry uh, there's a cognitive uh, uh, i mean if i you give me uh, time to express i about, don't have the time uh, yeah. so just have so, a minute so uda loop uda loops are getting crushed when we talk about observe orient decide and act these are getting crushed and their time limits are becoming so small that a human being in within the loop is not able to take the decision that's where the cognitive decision making has to be done by the machine Good. that's where we need to progress okay. that is one area and second area of course numbers matter if you really ask me numbers matter yeah. and if i look at the programs like lca getting into mark 2 which will fill in the gap as it goes out and and i'm ca coming up and filling up that's long so, term sir a uh, decade because right now we are not even getting so, mark 1 so, lca all okay, in okay 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 so uh, let's say that's long term and it's 10 years perspective so currently we need to deploy our forces in a manner that we remain give the credible deterrence the word is credible deterrence and maybe we secure our this thing 
As we know that in, the, if, in a conventional warfare, if you want to go offensive, it is 1 is to 3, otherwise it is 1 is to 8. So if they want to really come into the mountainous zone and they want to really uh, uh, do the attrition on us from the land forces, it will be too heavy a penalty for them, which they will not try. And secondly, Air Force, uh, as per his, you know, airfields like Bareilly, Gorakhpur, mm, Adampur, all, all that being there, where we can take off with max load, we can really engage them. I so got your point, sir. Thank you very much. I think one of the primary lessons that one has learned from the 62 debacle was that a show of intent is very important because if you, the adversary believes that you are not looking to confront him to defend your territory, he will try and walk into Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your wisdom and thank you very much for watching. Until our next episode, goodbye.